2 Samuel chapter 22. David speaking here. This is also in the book of Psalms. This is the, this is the latter. Uh, it, it's a combination here. It's, a, it's, it's the latter phase of David's life in certain sections. And then it's the beginning of, of other phase of his life, if that makes sense. If you can kind of try to reconcile that here. David wrote this. Actually, verse 1 explains when he wrote this. And there again, you find this also in the book of Psalms by, o- overall. It says, David spoke to the Lord. Isn't it interesting? He spoke to the Lord. The words of this song on the day, somebody say, on the day, when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Quick background story. David had fled from the hand of Saul approximately 13 plus years. Give or take a couple years, little discrepancy, but it's minute. But overall, you're looking at a good 13 years that David was on the run. David was, he, envision this, he fled for his life for 13 years. Now, now could, could, you, could you imagine, could you imagine everything at least being pretty much okay in your life? At least you have a place to live. You still got a job, and, or you might even have to change careers, but at least, at least overall you, you, you are gainfully employed, even though that may be marginal sometimes. And you still have people around you who love you and, and all of that, right? So you got that going on, uh, but, but still something is amiss in your life, and you really need a breakthrough. Well, see, David didn't have anything going on for him but God. I mean, there was nothing uh, tangible as far as, okay, uh, David at least has this going on. I mean... And and what happened for many, many years, not only was he fleeing for his life and Saul sent out, eventually Saul sent out over 10,000 of special op soldiers. That's really what they equated to. They were were the elite of the elite of the Israeli army. At one time, 10,000. Always there was at least 5,000 looking for David to kill him. So, that, so those are the circumstances. He's living. Now, eventually you start reading you, and you start looking in 1 Samuel, like chapter 22. Eventually, you know, it talks about him, him at the cave of Adullam, and, and many people started coming to him. Well, that was many years into his life of a fugitive. And there again, he didn't do anything wrong. He didn't do anything, nothing uh, illegal against Saul. He didn't even sin. And he's fleeing for his life. Many of those years, my point back to this, is he was by himself. He was by himself. His own father and brothers ostracized him. And rightfully so in some regards, because if they would have harbored him, if, if, if they would have aided and abetted him in any way, shape, or form, Saul would have killed all of them. So from that perspective alone, they said, you know, we... We can't help you. You're on your own. So for many years, he's all alone. No help from his own dad. No no help from his own brothers. No help from any family members. And then eventually, you know, he starts making his own way. You ever notice that? If you'll just keep serving God, eventually, eventually, crumbs will start dropping off the table to sustain you in what you're going through in life. Eventually, little by little, little by little, you're, you're able to make it. You're able to navigate to where eventually then, then, then he started having these small victories. Despise not the day of small beginnings. Because what may be a small victory in someone's eyes is huge to you. Because if they only knew what you were going through, if they only knew what you've been battling for all those years, if they only knew what you had been through and been up against, they would realize that you just got one of the biggest miracles that they could ever even imagine. So don't let anyone ever look down upon your miracle or breakthrough. Because if they only knew... In the circumstance, in the correct environment, that's a huge miracle in your life. It may be a nickel and dime a breakthrough, a miracle to somebody else looking at your miracle, but it was, it's a $10 million miracle to you because if they only knew there again how close you were to losing it all. So anyway, those are the, those are the situations. Little by little, he got these victories. So with the little victories, eventually added up to big victories. And then eventually people started realizing, you know what? David, he ain't such a bad guy. He got a bum rap. Why did we believe that stuff about him? Why did we believe what people were saying about him? We never even performed any due diligence to see if it was true or not. 
We just believe what the haters were saying. We just believe what the people in power were saying. We just believe what the people who attend the biggest church in the cities, the secret center church, were saying. Oh, excuse me. We, 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 we believe them, and we never, we never, ever really sought the true source. But you know what? There must be something to this because David's still going. David's gaining victory little by little, but in all actuality, those are huge victories going on in his life. So all of that had occurred where eventually then his, then his you know, when he, then he starts getting to a place where people see all of that, then they start joining him. You know, first and foremost, people who were in debt, distress, and discontent, the Bible said. So basically, he got the people that no one else wanted. And he said, you know what? I see potential in these people. I see something that God has put within them. We're going to build something big. And then his family joins him and says, you know what? I think you're anointed all along. And so then momentum begins to occur. And then things really begin to pick up. And you know the rest of the story that David, and many times he actually could have killed Saul, but he chose not to. Chose not to touch him whatsoever. Eventually, even though the hands of judgment and justice turn slow, eventually it occurred in the life of David. So now he's king, king over all of Israel. He's king over all of Judah, and that's what that's referring to. Is because it took, when, when, when Saul died, then David became king uh, over Israel to basically replace Saul, if you will. But part of the kingdom of Israel, Judah, primarily, they rejected him. It took another seven years... For them to observe him, for them to critique him, for them to judge him, for them to set back and see, well, I want to see if this works out first. And then finally they said, you know what? We we need to also substantiate the anointed on his life and the leadership capability. So we're, we're, we're going to become a united nation now. So that's what happened here. So not only was Saul taken care of several years before, now, all of his other enemies, because during that period, that even the seven years, he went out to battle, and he basically defeated everybody, defeated everybody, even though not all of Israel would fight with him, even though not all of Israel would join forces with him. He said, oh, it, it's all right, it's all right. And anyway, so now they saw these great exploits that he did, and now they come to him. Oh, that's, that's a four-week series right there, but i got to keep moving. Just file this one. Listen. Listen, when, when God does exalt you, just, just, uh, just forgive and forget the people who didn't believe in you when it was all, to the point where you almost didn't believe in yourself. You got you, you to let that stuff go. Tell somebody, you just got to let it go. Let them go. Let that go. And, 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 and if they joined you down the road, that's great. And if they didn't, you don't need them anyway. Amen. Bottom line is this. If people are brought into your life by God's destiny, they can't leave. If they weren't, they can't stay. It's as simple as that. If God brought them, they can't leave. If God didn't, they can't stay. Let me help you with this. If God brought them, you need to do your part to keep them. If God didn't bring them, make sure it's all right when they leave. Don't let the door hit you where the good Lord's... Oh, no, I better not say it. But anyway, so anyway. So all these great things are going on in life. All these great things are going on in life, and David just breaks out in song. He breaks out in thanksgiving. Verse 2, he says, and he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. You know know, know how you can really justify that someone is anointed when they're teaching and preaching and he ministering to you in any capability? It's because they've lived through it. See, really nothing is substantiated in someone's life unless you've lived through it. Unless you've experienced it, unless you've been hurt, you've been rejected, you've been down, you've been out, you've been up, you've been in, you've been every which way but sideways sometimes, and many times even sideways too many times. You've, you've, you've run the gamut. Like Paul even when Paul said that, that what it, what it, it, it doesn't depend on what state I am in, meaning I have been in so many different states of being in life, but I've always learned to be thankful and content with what God has in my life. Someone who has been through stuff, they can really deposit within you. So David, when he starts saying that God is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, 
the people are going, amen. I, I feel the brother on that one because he's lived that. So I know a little bit even of what he's been through, so I, I, I feel that in my own spirit. That's one of the ways you can determine if someone is ministering revelation knowledge to you is if it reveals something to you. Just as iron sharpens iron. You, 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 you know when someone is touching your heart in a given area that, needs, that you need help in, it's because they've been there. They've experienced that themselves. So when David's talking about, God, you're my deliverer, you're my fortress, the God of my strength in whom I will trust, in whom I will trust, goes on to say, my, my shield and the horn of my salvation. All this has so much import, but i got to keep moving. My stronghold and my refuge. Isn't that interesting? He keeps all of those, they're, they're spiritual synonyms of fortification, of safety, of security. There again, he, he lived, he lived in a waste howling wilderness for years and years of his life, no roof over his head whatsoever, but, but he realized that the hand of God was over him, that the hand of God protected and sheltered him from all things life. I will call upon the name of the Lord. We'll drop down to verse four. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Everyone say amen to that. When the waves, waves of death surrounded me, more than once, more than once. When the waves of death surrounded me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. Because there were times when he was going up against the Philistines, outnumbered 100 to 1. And a small army there, so outnumbered, the, the odds were insurmountable. And you start reading about David's mighty men. I want him killed 800. The reason why is because he had to kill 800 because they were outnumbered 800 to 1. So you start reading about their exploits, you go, man, unbelievable things that happen. So when David's talking about, listen, I know what it's like to be surrounded. This is what crazy faith says. This is what crazy faith says. When you're surrounded like that and the odds are so stacked against you, crazy faith says this. Excellent. I got them right where I want them. Got them right where, oh, some of you ain't catching that, but anyway, let me move on. Got them right where I want them. They're all right here congregated together. We're going to take them out right now. We're going to get this over with once and for all. He's not right in the head. But anyway, I love that part in brave head. Brave heart, he's not right in the head. But anyway, but anyway, um, well, sometimes you got to be like that, and David was like that. So he's thanking God that even in the midst of ungodliness and ungodly people, to the degree, to a degree, fear came upon him. He's transparent. He's vulnerable here. He's letting people know, listen, I, I know what it's like to be afraid. I know what it's like to be afraid. And as John Wayne said in the movie Train Robbers, this is, hey, this is all extemporaneous, not in my notes here, so you need to hear this. So it's the Holy Spirit bringing it out. And John Wayne said in the train robbers, this young man, they were, they were facing the enemy. They knew the enemy was going to ride over the hill. They were way outnumbered. There was no way they were going to get out of this. And this young guy, this is his first, you know, a, 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 a occurrence, if you will, in, 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 in a showdown. And uh, so John Wayne is trying to encourage him one-on-one -on -one before this thing breaks loose and all. And, and, and the guy says, you know, finally, he says, you know, I'm, 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 I'm afraid. And he asked John Wayne, aren't you afraid? Well, and he said, he said, he said, yeah, but courage is saddling up anyway. Courage is being afraid, but saddling up anyway. Tell somebody, get on the saddle. Let's just get it. Come on. We can do this thing. Courage is being afraid, but saddling up anyway. Let's drop over. Verse 17. He sent from above. Oh, my, my, my. He took me. He took me. There's a four-week series right there. He took me. If for no other reason, you need to be thankful that God took you. That God took you out of that mess. That God took you out of that former way of life. That God took you out of that former way of thinking. That God took you out of that previous relationship even you were in. That God took you out of where you once were. Somebody needs to give God some thanks that God just took you out. Slap somebody and say, I'm thankful God took me out. 
Slap somebody and say, I'm glad God took me out. I'm thankful he took me out. He drew me out of many waters. Oh, great significance there, but we need to move on. Goes on to say in verse 18, he delivered me from my strong enemy. David said, I, I, I couldn't have taken them by myself. I couldn't have got out of that one by myself. I couldn't have overcome that obstacle by myself. God is the one that delivered me from that thing that was stronger than me. The addiction that was stronger than me, God delivered it from me. The fear that was stronger than my own heart, faith, God delivered it from me. My situation, my environment, everything that was against me was too strong for me. God delivered me out of all of it. Oh, somebody needs to thank God right about now. Goes on to say, verse 19, they confronted me in the day of my calamity. Do you ever look at this? You know what that means? They were kicking me when I was down. I'm already in this calamitous state of life. It's like I couldn't get any lower, and that's when they come and kick me lower. That's just like the devil, isn't it? That's just like some mean-spirited people. You ever gone in a situation in your life just when you thought it couldn't get any worse? Now, stay with it because it's a negative confession. But just when you thought it couldn't get any worse... It got worser. But anyway, I know that's incorrect. That's why I use it that, that way. But anyway, they, they confronted me in the day of my calamity. It's like, are you kidding? You're doing that to me now? And you even know what I'm going through? You know what I've been through? You know, you know the precipice that I'm on right now? And you come and do that to me? David said, when I get back up on my feet, you better watch out. Oh, anyway. Which he did, actually, for what it's worth. Remember when he fled, had to flee from Jerusalem? When his own son Absalom overthrew his kingdom? This is actually after this. He's fleeing. This man by the name of Shimei came and began to curse David. I mean, David at the lowest point in his life, other than what we're reading right here. And Shimei began to curse him. One of David's mighty men pulled out a sword and said, I, I, I got this. I got this. I'm taking his head off right now. And he stopped him. David said, no, don't do it. He said, because if it is of the Lord, I'll receive it. But if not, God will bring vengeance. There's your assignment. Read, read and discover the end of Shimei. Just find out how it ended up for him. I'll leave it there. But anyway, goes on to say uh, in verse 20, he also brought me into a broad place. Oh, now. Look at this. Because if you notice this, about every four to, to five, six verses, that the last verse, it, it begins to turn into Thanksgiving. He basically begins to rehearse, record everything that had happened to him. And he begins to end it, the last one or two verses, and then it shifts in, okay, this also began to happen. It's like, okay, oh, I also experienced all these bad things too. But he ends it up by saying, the Lord turned it around. The Lord brought healing. The Lord brought favor. The Lord brought. He says it many different ways. So look at this in verse 20. He's saying that God brought me out into a broad place. This is what he's saying. David is saying, God enlarged my horizon of life. See, it was in this, in this time period. You find it in Psalm chapter 11 when God says that, when, when David said that God enlarged me in my distress. None of us like distressing times. None of us like to be stressed out in any area of our life. But one thing you need to realize, you stay with God. Those times that are stressful and filled with distress, God will open up doors for you. He will, he will broaden you. First and foremost, he broadens you. He increases your anointing. He augments your grace. He enlarges your faith. Your faith can never grow in a sterile environment. We don't like to hear this stuff, and we don't want to even hear this stuff. Your faith cannot grow in a sterile environment. Your faith has to be tested. Your faith has to be proven. Your faith has to be tried. I don't like it sometimes. You don't like it sometimes. But the only way you can increase your faith is by going through some hell or high water every now and then. Or else, how in the world will you ever find out that God is bigger than he currently is in your life if you don't go through some distress? Tell somebody God's bigger than you even realize right now, right now. 
He brought me to a broad place. David is simply saying, he enlarged my life. He enlarged my life, my sphere, not only of influence, but my perspective of God, my perspective of life even. God enlarged. God began to open my eyes to see so much of the broad spectrum of his all-consuming entity. He brought me into this broad place, enlarged me in every area in my life. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Huh. Because he loved me. Because he honored me. Because he cared for me. Because he is truly satisfied with my life. He, he, he did all that. He, he helped me with all of that. Because he delights in me. When you begin to realize that, listen, God helps you because he loves you. Because he cares for you. God has invested so much in you. He doesn't want it to go awry. You or it. The it referring to the investment that God has placed in your life. Some might not like that term, but, but I, I, I use it in the most dignified and spiritual way that I can. Uh, here's bottom line. Look at this. This is God's greatest investment. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he... In order to invest, you got to give. In order to invest in any area of your life, you have to give. When you make an investment, you're, it's because you're giving into someone or something. It can be financial, it can be spiritual, it can be relational, it can be a host of areas and ways, but you have to give in order to invest. So when God, the greatest investment of all, the greatest investment of the history of the world is that God gave, God invested his only begotten son into this world. And God always, always watches over his giving, his slash investment, because God wants to see a return on his investment. Now, I'm not secularizing this because stay with me. I'm spiritualizing this metaphorically here because God wants to see what he's put in your life grow. The faith he's put in you, he wants to see grow. The grace he's put in you, he wants to see it grow. The kindness he's put in you, he wants to see it grow. The love he's put in you, he wants to see it grow. He wants a return on his investment, meaning, oh, oh, nice. I love this because they're actually utilizing what I place within them. Oh, we got to move on. We got to move on. Verse 4, let's drop down there and look at this real quick. Like David goes on and says this, For you have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose against me. There again, Dave just recording all the great things that God did. Uh, you have given me the necks of my enemies, verse 41. Uh, verse 42, they looked, but there was none to say, even uh, to the Lord, but he did not answer them, referring to those who came against him, meaning God fulfilled the Abrahamic covenant there. That's what David's covering, is that those who curse me, you curse them, God. Those who bless me, you bless them, God. So David's recording all that. Drop down to verse 47. David goes on to say, The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. So now he's closing out this long psalm. Total of 51 verses here. Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let, the God of, let God be exalted. The rock of my salvation. It is God who avenges me and subdues the people under me. Referring to his enemies. Uh, he delivers me from my enemies. Uh, also lift up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from... The violent man, notice this, verse 50. Therefore, I will give thanks to the Lord. I'm going to cue that up again. Therefore, will I give thanks. to the Lord. One of the many reasons why, why David was used mightily by God is because David always had a heart of thanksgiving. No matter what he went through, he had a heart of thanksgiving. No matter what he was dealing with, he had a heart of thanksgiving. No matter, no matter what season of life he was in, his thanksgiving always radiated in so many different ways. Not only, not only, of course, to God, first and foremost, but to the people who were in his life. There again, people who were, who were busted and disgusted and broke up and dysfunctional and all that kind of stuff. David saw the good in them. David saw something good in them. You know, David didn't look at, oh, that's, 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 all, that's you know, all I got. David looked at it in this way. That's what I've got. I, I'm thankful for what I've got. And I tell you right there, when you get that paradigm shift going on in your heart and life, it'll help you every season of your life. When things which don't seem adequate enough, instead of saying, is that, is, is that all? Instead of, instead of saying that, it's, that's what? 
Instead of that's all, that's what? Because what God has given you can be multiplied, can be utilized, can be magnified to such a degree that that little bit that God has given you, the what, that may not seem acceptable in other people's eyes, that may not seem even enough, that what, five loaves and two fishes, a little bit of oil, just a little bit of leaven to make one last, one last loaf of bread. Just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit. Just a little cloud the size of a man's hand. I know it hadn't rained in three and a half years. I know that's not big enough, but, but, but that's what I see. Elijah said, that's the one that's going to do it. So when you begin to realize, you know what? That's what I got. I'm thankful for what I've got. I'm thankful for what I've got. It's not all I've got. It's what I've got. All I've got is God. What I've got is before me. I'll take the what I've got, combine it with the all I've got, and it's going to turn out all right. For more information about our teaching resources, visit our website at CICLive.com.